pleased to introduce someone you, some of you know well, <laughs> Jessica Barksdale Inclan, who's um, a national <coughs> bestseller and a prolific romance and contemporary author, and she's going to read to us tonight from this, the magical second book in her second romance trilogy. Please welcome Jessica. <laughs> Hello, welcome to all of you. Can you hear me without this? Yes, excellent, because it's hard to hold a book open and hold a microphone at the same time. Um, I was thinking about this idea of story, and one of the things with a story is that somebody actually has to start onto a story. Someone has to take the story and decide to go. I decided to start um, this reading with my character choosing to not go on her story. She doesn't want to take the adventure. In the hero's adventure, the hero always has to s s go find and go on the call and listen to the call and go on the journey. Well, my character, um, who has some magical powers, because this is a paranormal romance, as you can s see by the paranormal cover, um, she has hidden her own story from her, her, everyone in her life and is just trying to stay put. Of course, in a story, that can't happen, but it can happen for a little while. So this is right from chapter one. Claire Edwards had just absolutely had it, again, for about the sixth time that day. She wanted to scream and shout and stomp her feet, but since that reaction was exactly what was bothering her and others, she could not do any of that. She didn't want to roll around on the floor and temper paint like Annie or pee in her pants like Thomas. She didn't want to fall into instant and hysterical weeping and cling to a pillow in the corner like Sam. Maybe she wanted to stand shocked still in the corner with the rest of them, but theoretically she was in charge. She was, Claire finally realized, as she picked up the thrown barrel of blocks in order to get to Sam, the adult. She was the one paid for keeping, keeping things flowing educationally and psychologically for Annie, Thomas, Sam, and the 12 other children in her charge, all of whom were staring at her right now with wide, frightened eyes. Claire was in charge of environment and attitude. Claire was in charge of educational outcomes. Sam, she said, her voice like the blanket Sam was missing, the one his mother insisted he go without cold turkey this very morning. I promise that when you get home, your mommy will give you your blankie. It's just that it needs to stay home for now while you're at school. I want my blankie, Sam wailed. I want it now. Annie rolled toward Claire, smeared pri smearing primary colors everywhere. Thomas clutched his pants, whimpering. The rest of them chimed in, crying in sympathy for this horrible scene. All of them suddenly wanted their blankies, their mommies, the toilet, an afternoon snack, their pets, anything but this classroom. Claire knew that she shouldn't do it, couldn't do it, really, really mustn't do it, but she wanted to close her eyes, think of a spot, any spot on the planet. Ooh. <laughs> 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 She wanted to focus on the Kehlani Resort in Maui or the Mendocino Hotel in Mendocino. She wanted to think about the Tuileries Gardens in Paris. Frankly, she would be happy at the Starbucks on the corner of Masonic and Fulton, or the French laundromat on Stanion, the air thick with steam and soap, anywhere but here. The problem voice was, of course, that she could go wherever she wanted to, anywhere on the planet, just like that, just by thinking. By picturing a place, she could be there, and she had performed this trick for herself a hundred times or more since she discovered it when she was six. She could send herself anywhere, but coming back home wasn't easy. Claire wasn't sure why she couldn't bounce herself back home, but there really wasn't a resident expert on this kind of thing. There was no teleportation for dummies at the local bookstore. There wasn't anyone she could call up and ask, Hey, can you tell me why I can't get home the way I got here? You can't? Oh well, could you just explain to me why I can't even get close? Sure, she could triangulate her way around, flinging herself from place to place until she ended up closer to home, but mostly she had to do it the old-fashioned way. Bike, car, bus, cab, boat, train, plane. Of course, when she decided on a whim to disappear, she hadn't managed to pack a thing, not that she could take anything with her, 
And one, on one sad day, when she failed a college exam in statistics, she'd ended up in Hawaii without a bikini or a credit card. <laughs> she'd cringe when she thought of the phone call she'd had to make to her mother, though the two days wait for a driver's license at the Oahu Holiday Inn had actually been fun. But who cared about that now? In less than a second, she could be away from all this and drinking a Mai Tai on the veranda of the Kailani Inn, assuming, of course, the staff took pity on her credit cardless self. Annie, Thomas, and Sam would think they blinked too long, and Claire had just stepped out of the classroom. The children would stop crying, surprised, and then excited that they were left all alone, by themselves, no adult in sight. After a moment of exhilaration, they would start crying again, this time even harder. Chaos would ensue. All the children would throw paint, pee in their pants, and sob in the corners. They would be forever marked and ruined by this horrifying abandonment and become troubled, over-pierced, drug-addicted teenagers who would look back on this class and all of their education as an abusive waste of time. What was worse was that if Claire wanted to, she could dive into their minds, see the patterns of shock and confusion and understanding. As quickly as she could travel to any place on the planet, she could get into the little stream of consciousness that flowed strong through Annie's mind. What would Claire find there? Images of school and home, friends and pets and siblings? Or something worse, something scary and horrible, images Claire would never recover from. After hearing things meant for no one but the thinker, after seeing grief and despair and sexual positions and partners no one should know about, Claire stopped. She didn't dip into anyone's mind but her own, clamping down tight and holding onto her thoughts and her thoughts only. And childhood was too fraught a place, full of dark forests with evil step-parents, confusing events no one explained, and nightmares that made sleeping with the light on crucial. She didn't want to do that one last thing that would ruin everything for them. Claire knew how hard it was to overcome something from childhood. She had been trying to overcome her gifts since forever. Sam, Claire said, picking him up and cradling him in her arms, knowing that if she were a male kindergarten teacher, she could never do this. It's okay. It will be all right. Claire looked out at her class, all of them staring at her, even Annie, who glanced up at her with a, blear, a blue smeared face, even Thomas, who stopped his incessant whimpering. I promise you, it will all be okay. They stared at her. The big white clock on the wall moved its long black hands in clicking seconds. Claire stayed in the classroom, held Sam, who stopped crying too. Really? Annie asked, and Claire nodded, wishing she were agreeing to what was true. Yes, she said, it will all be 100% okay. Thank you. Our next reader is Susan Frankel. I, I was worried about the last name there. <laughs> Susan's award-winning and highly praised chronicle of the history and fate of a perfect tree reads 